okay uh, so hello everyone uh, we will be uh, uh, welcome to session 2 of uh, math lab computational tools uh, we will be starting in a minute um, this session uh, we will aditi will get started with the session so um, i think uh, please have fun and uh, hope you uh, you know uh, take as much as you can from this session we'll try to go slow and we'll try to ensure that if you have any doubts please feel free to ask in chat here or if you are attending the live stream on youtube please uh, ask your doubts there uh, we have dedicated chat moderators to clear these doubts so they will be active all the time and they'll be waiting for your doubts and your responses and your enthusiasm so please do feel free to uh, ask your doubts all right so yeah let's get started uh yeah so uh, good morning everyone uh, we are very thrilled uh, to have everyone with us today for session 2 of math lab uh before we begin uh session 1 uh from session 1 we have a few responses uh who we would want to give a special shout out for so uh these were responses that were sent in until 9:30 am today and they have like either 100% accuracy or a great amount of effort was put into their work so yeah thank you uh, yeah we really appreciate that and thank you for that uh so yeah you have nikhil samudranil amosam adhavan sonalika jyoti anurag nitesh uh, and ayush singh a special shout out for actually writing newton raphson in c++ um samarth and chaitanya shiva ashik ruthvik rohit harit sumit kanishka uh harit uh sumit okay prajwal ishu and ash so yeah a huge shout out to all of you and we hope you continue with the same for the rest of the two sessions as well uh right this brings us to today's session a numerical methods of computation which will be taken the first half of the session will be taken by me aditi i am uh, i'll be going to my second year and i am a coordinator in, of the mathematics club and the second part will be taken by pranjal uh, so yeah i think we're good to go all right so uh, let's start off uh, at a similar note where we left last time so uh, yeah and i i also wanted to mention that if you have any doubts or if you have any questions or answers to any questions uh, feel free to write them down in the chat box or uh, there are moderators dedicated towards uh, checking your work over there and helping you out right or wrong and we encourage that you actually use this tool and uh, you know be as interactive as you can throughout the session uh yeah so to begin with uh, there is a set of images on the left and the right and they seem to convey the same information but uh, there's actually a very fundamental difference between these two if you can think of any write them down uh, again they will be seen and you will be heard uh, so the, the the image on the right is of a digital clock right it tells you the time but its degree of accuracy is only limited to the last place of how much time it can tell it can't be any more accurate than that for example if it tells you time in seconds then you cannot you cannot make measurements for milli uh, milliseconds etc and another point is that whatever whatever degree of accuracy you have it's not it's not very complete you can always have a time interval that is shorter than that right and why this happens is because you are measuring time which is a continuous process through a discrete mechanism so how, if you really want to tell the exact time a continuous process uh what's a smart work around around that right so the way to go is that you measure a continuous process continuously and a very uh, trivial example of that is the working of your analog clock so the continuous process that we choose in this case is the uh, revolu- the rotation of the hands so 360 degrees is analogous to some time 
and we've been wired to interpret it that way so yeah this is a this is uh, i mean for the first time when i saw this even i was kind of perplexed by it that how can there be such a big difference so at any snapshot if the hands of the analog clock are moving continuously enough the time that you get will be extremely accurate and there is no discrepancy in the last few digits of its um, of the time uh, towards a few seconds milliseconds nanoseconds so uh, that was interesting and again a building building upon that you have uh, uh, 1 by 3 and 0.333 uh, there's a uh there's there's a key difference here also so 0. in 0.333 you you are never actually at 1 by 3 you're always free to add a few more recurring decimal places which give you a better approximation whereas 1 by 3 is exact you don't really care about how those three parts were made but if and when three parts were made um accurately and you chose one of them then you would have exactly one third so it's a, it's more of an idea than something that can it's more of an a uh, concept uh, of fra- uh, of fractions if we don't think about so much in our daily life uh and we tend to think that the decimal representations and fractions are the same but actually they're not so if you notice that on the right uh, both of them for both the cases you can add a few more decimal places get an exact answer and this is exactly how our how our systems work systems that we have uh, we've created to measure right they always have something we call a least count Com- computers also have there's only a certain degree of accuracy that you can uh, get through a computer so uh, we operate under the realm of two constraints the first being you cannot get values as small as you like they come at a cost and the second thing you can't even and you can't even store and even storing data is expensive right so this is exactly where numerical computation comes in because the this is the this is the crux behind how uh, computation is actually carried out uh, in computers right so and we are engineers and we we, uh, we want to model real life situations we don't want hypothetical answers so we try to end the answer as close to the actual or analytical answer and this is your actual or analytical answer and this is exactly where we left off left off last time right uh, moving on okay so uh, this is something i expect a lot of a lot of people to actually have a good idea about um so we'll just go through these questions here say i know the value of a function at a point as well as its derivative at that point is there something that can be said about points lying close by uh if you know please answer in the chat yeah so uh, let's take a look at this animation for the sake of clarity at roughly this point which looks like 26 on the x axis uh, a tangent has been sketched and so you know the value of the function at that point you also know the derivative of the derivative the green line represents the tangent line and you can see that for a pretty reasonable area the tangent line and the curve actually overlay each other right so what can be said the the better way to say that the tangent line approximates the curve at that point um the second question Uh, do you notice any problems with this method so i'm just going to play this animation right so the the purple circle it represents the scope of uh, the region of interest and as you can see is as i increase that the tangent line begins to massively falter so it's only good up to a few places right so that's the problem it works uh for points close by uh, the tangent line is a pretty good approximation uh and another question i have here is can you think of a function where this approximation is 100% accurate so yeah, i'm going to leave that to you and the moderators to or uh, uh, to do it in the chat uh yeah so this is exactly what a linear approximation is uh, if any in case anyone didn't know Right. Okay, so let's make a few changes to the first problem. Uh, 
you have information about the value of a derivative at a point on 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 the function so you have the first order differential equation over here uh what really is a first order differential equation if you have dy by dx it's essentially giving you the slope uh, uh the slope of the tangent at every point on the line so you have value of the derivative over here and you are also provided with one set of values that satisfy the equation uh this represents a family of curves and this pinpoints to the exact function that you want to check so what's the so what are we trying to achieve here uh you want to rebuild the function that satisfies this derivative and the given set of points the only catch here is that you cannot integrate so uh, hey aditi uh, yeah, yeah. could you just uh, represent this part again uh, i think your video is slightly frozen uh okay uh have i been audible the whole time yes you have been audible all right wait. so you want me to stop sharing and start again uh, tr uh maybe try turning off your video and present maybe it my uh, the maybe the presentation might be a little smoother uh is this better uh atreya uh na uh, uh your video isn't visible for me okay um, because it's can i just see it or not um, uh okay try to reshare once okay i'll give you a minute Is the screen is visible? Um, content is not visible right now. Uh, um, can you see okay, the presentation? Uh, yeah, fine. I'll rejoin the meeting. Maybe that should. Be yeah, try to rejoin the meeting. I'm sorry about this. Yes, this is the right. Okay, cool. And video also now. Yes. Okay, nice. See numeric uh, computers and their uh, shortcomings. <laughs> analytical computers is probably what have happened. Uh. Okay, so uh, was this uh, explained? That uh, the slide explained? Uh, we couldn't see the slide. I think uh, you the video paused at the last slide. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, everyone was with me till here, and after that. Uh, i lost connection here yeah. so yeah let's make a few changes to the first problem uh, you have a differential equation over here uh, first it's a first order derivative which uh, gives you a family of curves and from that family of curves by specifying the point we decide what curve we want to a function we want to work on so your task is to rebuild the function but the catch over here is you cannot integrate uh so if you can think of any ways that would be interesting um but yeah let's move on 
so how do you, how, how do we go about this right uh the idea is pretty simple the intuition behind this is pretty simple if you sample a nice number of points on this and you know the order in which they are supposed to be done in one after two two after three so on and so forth and even if you're very bad at drawing you will still be able to come up with this figure quite neatly uh so that's the idea and how do you go about this uh the idea comes from a linear approximation so between every two points you make some kind of a linear interpolation so let's actually see how this builds before uh, getting into any uh, getting into the actual method and i and i'd encourage that you try to think of this on your own uh, we'll anyways we'll discuss the whole algorithm later but uh, up to then right so this is your actual function the blue line and what we have created is we have built the function on the red line so uh, the red line is a function that we have built and the points that we are sampling is after every five so if you see a uh, zero to five then five to 10 10 to 15 15 to 20 and 20 to 25 so it's exactly there where our uh, you can see the slope of this is changing so since the slope is changing what you can say is that we know the derivative of the of those places is changing so we are taking input about around five points in the given domain and then we are trying to build up on this function yeah so the step size over here is equals to 5 uh, this is incorrect yeah i think it uh, you know and uh, we'll now the step size uh, the step size here should be 1 uh, we'll see what happens if instead of sampling at every five points if it if you haven't understood what's exactly happening that's fine too i just want to uh, give some kind of notion as to how this how this plays out actually uh, instead of sampling every five points we're uh, we're sampling every one point over here so let's see what kind of changes that makes so as you can see the function that we are the the red line is the function that we are sketching is it's a, it's much better and it's much closer to the actual function compared to what we did last time uh we can actually look at it for a particular point yeah so see at x is equals to 10 the value of the actual function is 160 but the value that we got was 85 which is pretty bad and uh, we'll do the same thing over here uh, we'll stop this at x is equals to 10 and yeah it's 145 so from a just by sampling points closer together we've gone from 85 to 145 which is a far better approximation uh so you can see that you're actually building the function over every small step that you're taking instead of integrating it <laughs> so now coming to the algorithm as to how this actually works so uh, you can be pretty sure of the first point on the graph since it's already provided that was 0 comma 0 and you know the derivative at that point and not only at that point you know the derivative at every point hence your differential equation and you also know that for a reasonable distance on the tangent line for a reasonable distance the tangent line approximates the curve so what i can do is i know the point i know the derivative just sketch a tangent uh, sketch the tangent line at that point for your small distance uh, or step size so the next point you pick should lie close to the previous point and somewhere on the tangent line and this is exactly what euler's method of uh, numerical integration is it's pretty intuitive uh, if you come to think of it uh that's why we recommended like trying to get a grasp of this on your own all right so a uh, small quiz which of the following will make your results more precise uh, reducing step size including higher order derivatives assuming okay a non linear interpolation let me just explain that um yeah so here 
yeah here when you connected points 2 and 3 uh, you assume that the line will be straight a non linear interpolation is basically letting go of that assumption and we will take around i'll we'll, we'll have around 2 3 minutes for you guys to submit your responses to that question it's a multiple option correct question and i think even if you don't get all options right right uh, at this point of time it's okay cuz uh, we'll cover some stuff uh, later on through the session so yeah we'll wait for a few minutes for you guys to answer i i hope the poll is ready yeah uh, this is a multiple option correct question but yeah it's fine one uh, you can put uh, put in any options that you find accurate yeah i'll show slide here yeah. sorry yes these are your four options yeah and okay you and 16 is just uh, using 16 bytes of your memory like it's So it's more storage. It allows you to store more information compared to UNT8. And you are using a computer to do this. Let me make that assumption clear. we will discuss solutions in a bit or just put answers right now we'll wait for like just one more minute probably we'll start yeah i think uh, we can we'll continue yeah we'll get back to the solution of this question we'll discuss some more and we'll get back uh, yeah so i'll resume uh, okay so interesting answers uh, we'll see what the correct ones are um, before that uh, let's go over something called error analysis now we've spoken so much about uh, numerical methods and how they're different uh, it's important to it's important to see how error how error is being generated by our very own computer which kicked me out uh, a few minutes ago so uh, firstly precision errors right exactly numbers is recurring in decimal places how would you store them in a computer you don't have infinite amount of memory to allocate to just one number uh because the decimal places are recurring and every time you cut off something you're actually losing information uh and say you're running an experiment uh, whatever whatever the uh, whatever the least count of your apparatus is uh if you have more if you have more decimal places than that then that's not even useful right so these sometimes precision errors uh, show up uh, quite badly uh when what you when what you want to compute actually requires that degree of precision then this becomes a problem and the second thing is discretization errors so i'm pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with this this is taylor series and this is like uh the holy grail of uh, you know uh, finding the value of a function at another point uh x minus so let's how this works f of x This is the point that you want to find. F of a is the information of the point that you already have. X minus a is the distance between the point you want to find and the point you have, which is equivalent to a step size in this situation. I hope that's clear for someone who didn't know what Taylor's series was. So if you look at this closely, 
to now we have taken f of x f of a and we have considered the first derivative terms after this have completely been chucked off so that shows up as error because taylor series is 100% accurate we cannot get into the proof of taylor series right now but if you go to think of it uh, it 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 does make sense that you add more you may not know the actual value of a function at the point but you have if you have information about all required derivatives you are good to go uh, but with euler's method we have restricted ourselves to only the first derivative so all these other terms from f double dash a to your uh, to the as many terms as are non zero they show up as errors now there are two kinds of errors uh, one is local error so error that shows up at each step so what lo local error basically assumes that the step that you took before it was accurate how much error has built up on that so i am assuming f of x is absolutely correct uh, f of a is absolutely correct i'm finding f of x uh, hiding all these other terms so this is your error and since x minus a is a step size which we will call h from now on your local error is proportional to h square uh a lot of you might ask but there are terms of h to the power n which are greater than square uh the thing is that we are assuming h to be less than 1 so h square is greater than h to the power n and that's the highest uh, degree of error so we will call we'll call the error proportional to h square and then you have global errors so the thing with local errors is that you assumed that uh this was correct however this was also not correct because this was also derived from a point before that So the net accumulated errors, that is, uh, local errors into the total number of steps you took. So s square into something is your global error, and it would be nice if you could actually uh, tell the proportionality in the chart. For local error, for global error, sorry, local is proportional to s square. Uh, all right so i'll give the answer uh h square into number of steps so say l is the domain or uh, the part that you're interested you have to find number of steps so you divided by the width of each step that is l by h so h square into l by h global error is proportional to h and yes h is worse than h square because uh, h is less than 1 yes. i hope the error analysis part is clear All right. So coming to the correct answers uh, for our questions, the first uh, option, reducing step size. Yeah, that actually works. We saw how changing the step size from five to one gave a better approximation. So yes, that definitely works. That's correct. Including a few higher order derivatives. Now, since we saw what Taylor series is, the more derivatives you include in your function. the better approximations you get so even that works because that gives you um, a more accurate response for f of x assuming a non linear interpolation so what makes this uh, what makes our um, thing linear what makes euler's method linear is that we only consider to this term starting from this term onwards it cannot be linear anymore because if you are including the second derivative you have to include the square term also and yeah option d using u and 16 instead of u and 8 uh, this also uh, gives more precise answers because of the precision errors that we saw if you inc increase storage space then obviously your answers will tend to be more accurate i hope this is, i hope uh, the options are clear we'll stop for a few minutes for attendance Yeah, a chat mode. You guys can give attend. You can post attendance now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll go over option C and D again. Um. Yeah. Just a minute. Where did that go? Okay. Uh. So 
डिड यू अंडरस्टैंड टिल ऑप्शन बी Yeah. Okay. Uh, so option B was clear. So the thing is that yeah. So uh, what is a linear interpolation? So when you are joining points, you are using a straight line. If you stop using a straight line. Your interpolation. Ah, uh, interpolation is basically for your your ah. Uh, You're considering every fifth point or every next uh, natural number while um, finding the derivative. So for points between that, you do something. You interpolate basically. You just join them. If you join them in a straight line, it is linear. And if you if you don't use a straight line, then it's non-linear. So if you have included the so I hope this is clear that you have included f dash a in Euler's method. But if you want a more If you want a more accurate, uh, uh, a more accurate response for f of x, you use f double dash. A. Now, when you write it like you included x minus a term here, you would have to include x minus a square term also. And as soon as x minus a square happens, it becomes nonlinear. I hope that's clear. And yeah, option D. Is increasing storage space. So we saw that uh, errors show up due to precision, because uh, computers enable us to only store a finite amount of um, fine a uh, finite amount of memory, right? So if uh, if there are a lot of decimal places, and if you if you have the capacity to include more, your answer will be more precise, and that's exactly what the question was. Uh, is it clear now? Okay. When you know, interesting. When you know the nature of the curve, if the curve is linear, obviously you don't need a non-linear interpolation. But the nice thing about that is your double derivative also goes to zero. d square y by d x square. That will also go to uh, that will also go to zero since. dy by dx is only a function of x and not of x square so automatically that term vanishes i hope that's clear okay yeah oh, yeah global error is proportional to h okay global uh global error uh, proportional to the global error is local error into the number of steps cuz at every step error is At every step thus far, error has been built. Okay, so um, we'll continue. Yeah, we we'll, we'll move on to the next next thing. If you have questions, I think uh, in the chat they will be answered. Yeah. Uh. So. Uh. We saw Euler's method, and we saw that it's it's not even very accurate. Uh, we've come up with a few modifications to Euler's method. That okay, I'm getting a response to wait for just a couple of minutes more. I will do that. Uh, is my presentation visible? Ah uh, yes, yes, your presentation is visible. Yeah. Okay. Ah uh, yes, Tomeshwar, you're uh, raising your hand. Um, do you have any question?
you can unmute and ask a question if you want. Yeah, um, so modifications and new methods. So yeah, there are some very fundamental problems with Euler's method. The main being that you're assuming the value of the derivative to be the same throughout each interval or time step. But obviously that is not the case, right? So how do you fix that? And the, met the thing that uh, we've come up with to make these corrections is you first predict, make a prediction using Euler, and then you and then you make some correction to it. And hence, they're also called predictor corrector methods. And uh, if you want to check how much errors you you're generating through your own new method, whatever that is, you simply substitute in Taylor series and see how it works. Um, okay, so we'll take a look at the first method. So the first method is midpoint method. Now, uh, one difference you'll notice here is that your derivative uh, is a function of both variables here from here on. So it's a little slight hint at multivariable calculus, but uh, nothing very hard, right? So your predictor step is basically your Euler step. So what you're doing is in your predictor step, instead of taking the full step of h, you take it at only h by two. And you know that reducing step size reduces error. So this will this will definitely be more accurate. And in your corrector step, that is uh, the step that you will take to uh, minimize the error. So first you find this, uh, what this is at, uh, at y, at exactly half the step size. And then what you actually plot is your corrector step, not your predictor step, if, if, if I confuse anyone. Um, so, here, this is what you will be substituting for your derivative will no longer be the derivative at the initial point. It will be the derivative at the midpoint, which is which does seem a lot more sensible given that you're using the same derivative throughout the entire interval. It makes a lot more sense to use the derivative at the midpoint than to use the derivative at the initial point. And this actually, uh, this actually has significance when we analyze the error over here. So the error, uh, local error, also known as local truncation error. So how do you obtain that? That is, um, first you apply a Taylor series expansion on the previous term. Again, the previous term for both of these is the same. This is so. So this is capital Y n plus one. This is small Y n plus one. So they're representing two different things. They're representing one step after a previous term. And in both the cases, the previous terms are the same. So this one, the difference, where's the difference then, right? If the previous terms are the same. If the difference is how, in terms of how the next term is opting. So capital Y n plus one is applied by, by doing a Taylor's expansion of the previous term and the small Y n plus one is obtained via midpoint method. That is the method that we've discussed here. So just to a brief synopsis of this, you start at a point, uh, you do an Euler's um, approximation for a point at half the step size, you find, and when, you're, when, and when you're actually applying the algorithm, instead of using the derivative at the initial point, you use the derivative at this new point, which is midway. Uh, I hope this is clear, then we'll go to the, uh, next part. Okay, so yeah, so for those of you who've seen multivariable calculus, this won't be that painful, but uh, for the rest of us, we'll see. So just look at this for right now, right? We said we are applying a Taylor's expansion of the previous term, and that's exactly what we're doing. So 
the previous term in both cases is the same small y n capital y n both are same we have taken only small y n here and we have applied a taylor series expansion so that x minus a is h your first derivative h square by 2 that is x minus a square by 2 factorial that term is also a uh, very understandable the problem will come when you will try to compute the second um, f double dash of a because now you have two variables but i think we did see in the last session how uh, how these kinds of derivatives work so you 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 take a part you take so uh, the important thing to remember is f p of y is already a derivative with respect to t d by dt of that is like taking its derivative once again so even if you don't understand how this works it it's it's not that important um so you basically take derivatives with respect to the individual variables so do f by do y again f is already a derivative let me remind you that's it's showing up here f dash of x into x minus a f dash of a into x minus a x minus a is h and f dash of a is this term which is already a derivative so uh, a lot of people get confused because uh, they think that a derivative term should come here but yeah we've already mentioned that f t comma y is is dy by dy by dt uh so this is how you compute your second derivative simply substitute it over here and the next term that you get will be something h cube by 3 factorial so it's something of the order cube so that is the first term for you that is uh this side y n plus 1 let's go to the thing that we obtain via midpoint method now okay so first things first of uh, multi variable taylor series what we saw taylor series was for f x plus a but what if there are two variables and how does that work so first obviously f of x comma y then h is the increment from h k is the increment from your other variable so h into the partial derivative with respect to x plus k into the partial with respect to y and after this all your terms will be of the second derivative so terms like x square k square 2hk so on will will start showing up but for us since we are applying eulers and eulers concerns itself with only the first derivative we we don't need taylor's expansion beyond this point except for knowing the fact that after this the proportionality is with x square which is the increment from h and there will be a term having k square and one term logically if there is x square k square and the combination of both is also possible that's where 2k h comes from and when you uh, write for the cubic term you will find all your um, 3c uh, all your combinate um, permutations and combinations of the third term possible over there but uh, we'll skip that for now so applying exactly uh, yeah okay this h square and k square so when you write uh, the when you when you write taylor's expansion for this you will get terms uh you will get in terms of h square and k square i'm sorry if this is confusing anyone to uh think that h square into k square it's not like that there'll be one term having h square there'll be another term having k square but the important thing is that the uh the order uh, of this will be h square since we are assuming that the increment in step is less than 1 i hope that's clear now uh, what it means uh, okay fine we'll continue uh, and then you make that substitution over here so in place of h you x plus h you have t plus h by 2 in place of y plus k you have y plus what was obtained over here i will probably not um, go very deep into this uh this but yeah it's it's pretty really understandable you are doing a taylor series approximation for this so h by 2 over here is nothing but h over here and f of x is here is f of t here so that's where this term comes from um 
f of y here is the same thing over here and your increment that is h by 2 f y of t comes over here i think that's pretty clear so when uh, so when you write y n plus 1 in terms of y n plus uh, in terms of your y n plus your h into the derivative this is what you get all h square terms go away leaving your uh, truncation local truncation error proportional to h cube as we saw in uh, eulers it was proportional to h square and again h cube is better than h square because we are assuming that h is less than 1 uh if this is not very clear uh, it's fine cuz it requires a little bit of understanding of yeah okay so let's leave the proof the proof is something that anyone can do if you know how it has to be done uh we'll go over this thing once again so a predictor step you know eulers isn't accurate so you make a prediction and you try to correct it in some manner so your in your predictor step instead of going the whole distance h the whole you're taking a step and that step size is h instead of taking the whole step size you take half the step size over here and in your corrector step over here you use the derivative at that point because the differential equation will be uh, you use the derivative the, see the differential equation is a function of t and y it's not only a function of x like it was last time so y i that is your previous a uh, previous value and h into some derivative the derivative that you are using this time is the derivative found at the midpoint versus the derivative found in the at the initial point in euler's method if the intuition is clear we'll move on i mean uh, the error and all is fine that uh, self you can do it on your own any time later okay so uh you you will probably need to think about it a little bit but it, it's not that hard so there's another method called uh, yunes method where what we did last time is we went to the midpoint found the slope and used that but what we do for this method is instead of taking the slope at the midpoint you find the slope at your initial point the predictor point and take an average of those two and use it does this make sense so here to all your h square terms go away leaving your error proportional to h cube okay so yeah the next part are straight lines the way to go or uh, most of you already answered this in that in that question uh, that other approximations are pretty possible and uh, reasonable too uh, so we we'll look at uh, i want you to look at this animation so so far we've tried to get uh, retrieve a function from its differential from its uh, first from its differential equation its first order derivative we are basically we are trying to find an alternate for integration only it's equivalent to integrating it but not by the conventional method by uh using approximations that's what we have done so far so here um so what's happening here is we're taking three points and we're finding the parabola which approximates it in the best way uh okay uh previous slide yes is there anything wait i'll switch to teams is there anything that needs to be explained again Uh is this clear? Okay, you want an explanation for this. Okay. Um So for what we did, okay, first Euler's method. The very basic thing. you start at a point find the derivative at that point use that derivative for the whole step h 
then midpoint method you start at a point find the but you are going to travel a whole step size of h so instead of using the derivative at the initial point use the derivative at the midpoint for the whole step size and then very similar to this is this method and what you do here is uh start find the derivative at the initial point find the derivative even at the next point where which you would have found for euler's method but you use an average of those two over here see again the problem the only problem with uh, euler's method is you are assuming that the derivative remains constant throughout your step size i hope that's clear now all right nice hmm. moving on oh uh, yeah so yeah uh, this animation suggests that yeah if you have three points you can easily find a parabola which approximates these those points and yeah the function here is x cube plus x square plus 6 um yeah it probably looks like it's zero but the uh, first interval is 2000 so 6 is 6 looks like it lies on zero but no that's not the case so there is a rule that helps us do these integrations uh so sol solving you understand it solving a differential equation is equivalent to just doing the integration which is equivalent to finding the area of the, of a curve given a function finding the function given a differential equation the tool that you use is the same when you want to find the area under the curve uh given that you have the function with you so um like you saw over here uh there's a there's a parabola which is approximating every three points so now instead of finding the area under the function we'll find the area under the parabola with this and this limit and uh and then there's something called simpson's one third rule which helps us do this very easily so uh, what you do is that for whatever area you have to integrate what simpson says is that it is equal it's equivalent to whatever h is again your step size so x by 3 your a uh, first and last points you write the, uh, you write the value of the function as it is over those two points and then you alternate with four and two weights for even and odd places respectively uh the proof of this is quite tedious we will not go through that right now but if you want to take a look we use this rule in approximating the area under the parabola because if you actually have to do ax square plus bx plus c uh that and then integrate it find a find b find c that is your uh the co leading coefficients of your parabola that's quite tedious so better than that you mm -hmm. use this rule so f a and f b are your two boundary points you write them as it is and then you weight this by 4 over here so you use simpson's rule and if instead of uh, instead of using three points if i use five points uh, for approximating the area under the parabola i would go 1 2 3 4 and 5 i would use five points f a and f b that is your starting and initial points should have been the same and then that and then you have three more points that you have chosen that you have to add so the first one would be multiplied by 4 then by 2 and then by 4 again but since you have only three points you write the boundary points first f a and f b and then you start weighting them even and odd like 4 and 2 respect odd and even 4 and 2 respectively so that is simpson's one third rule uh the interesting thing about this is just doing this much makes your error proportional to h to the power 5 which is again a far far better situation than uh, eulers or your modified eulers method and uh, if you want to read a little bit more uh, i've attached this link over here it's uh, it's it's a nice explanation i found on the internet for this if you are very into and really want the proof um and if you want the proof for this just this much i have that too 
it will be shared later yes that's it from me thank you Yeah, higher the power of h, lower the error is. Assuming that h is less than one. Yeah, uh, we'll share the second attendance link now, and uh, Pranjal will uh, continue after this. Thank, thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah, uh, doubts. Yeah, we can take a few questions. Attendance and doubts now. Yeah, three three by eight Simpson is also another method. The only difference in three by eight Simpson is that uh, here the weight for this is two four two four so on. Uh, for three eight Simpson, the way, the way that you weight your uh, functions is slightly different. Nice question. Uh, wait, I'll share my screen. Okay, so is this curve a parabola? No, right? It's working for any general curve. What we chose here was a parabola. We want to find its area easily, and we are using Simpson's rule for that. Simpson's rule doesn't really have much to do with parabolas. We're uh, we're using Simpson's rule to make our life a little bit easier. I hope that answers your question. Um. Okay. Yeah, Yon's method is improved Euler's method. It's exactly that, predicting by Euler's method and making some correction to it. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think Dina answered the question.
Yeah. Um, am I audible and visible? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. My screen is visible, right? Okay, so hey guys, I'm Pranjal Vashne. I'm one of the uh, I'm one of the coordinators of the Mathematics Club here at IIT Madras. And now you'll be learning the basics of GNU Octave and whatever you have learned in the pa uh, last part, like the Euler's method. I'll code for that and I'll give a basic intro to method or differences and I'll also code for it. Okay, and uh, I hope everyone has installed Octave and it's uh, able to run code. And if you guys haven't, then it's totally fine. You guys can just learn how to write code and then you can implement it yourselves later on after the session. Will anyway be sharing the slides? OK, so let's begin. So what is Octave? Like, why do we use Octave? So Octave is used for scientific computing and numerical computation. It is used to solve linear and nonlinear problems. So like you have learned the Euler's method, right? I'll be teaching you how to uh, numerically compute Euler's method and another method called the method of differences. And if you guys have learned about uh, signal processing, the uh, Octave is very helpful for signal processing as well. And Octave has got inbuilt tools to like plot data and analyze data. So that's why we'll be using Octave. It's very efficient in some tasks. Know that Octave is case sensitive. So by, by case sensitive, what I mean is suppose there's a command CLC. So that command will be uh, only be executed if it's written in small letter that is small CLC. And if you type in any capital letter or in some other format only, then it like it will throw an error. It won't run. So yeah, please know that while you're writing your code. Okay. Let's go to the basic commands and operations in Octave. So there are two basic commands, clear all and CLC. And I'll be discussing what they do later on in when I code, not now. And there are two uh, other commands, disp and input. So disp command is used to is used when you want the user to read a read some message. And input command is used when you want the user's input to take in into some variable that you have defined. OK, and there are a few basic operations that you can do on Octave. You can do arithmetic operations very efficiently, like it's very easy and fast to do on Octave. And you can define arrays. And if you guys don't know what an array is, it's basically a matrix. OK, and you can create loops and functions. This makes your code run faster and the debugging time becomes shorter. Like uh, the, even the length of the code becomes shorter if you loop, if you use loops and functions. And as I've said before, yeah, you can plot data very efficient, uh, efficiently and you can analyze it. OK, so let's begin with the basics of Octave. So to display something, you use the disk command and this is the syntax for disk. So you write in disk and whatever message you want the user to read, you will write that in brackets and under double quotes. So if you want the person to read hello world, this is how you will write the uh, the code for it. OK, and if you have defined a variable X and you want the user's input to be stored in X, this is the syntax for that. X is equals to input and whatever message you want the user to read. So that will be that will again come in brackets and semicolon. And after the user reads the message, he will type in whatever he, whatever is required. Like here it's enter number. So the user will type in the number. OK. So yeah, uh, remember that if you keep a semicolon at uh, any at the end of any line of code, it makes that line run in the background. So like I'll uh, show you with an example when we code. OK, yeah, so let's begin our first Octave program. Let's switch to Octave. Hope you guys are ready with that. OK, so before we begin, uh, you guys have to first get a folder. OK, this folder will contain all your code files. So it's preferred that you save your uh, save a folder in the C drive and then to load that folder here, you can load it in the file browser on the top list. You can you guys can see that, right? So for that, you can just type in the file path. Like I've already created my folder math demo and I've already loaded it here as well. So uh, and then after that, after you load it, you have to click enter. OK, and uh, you see four tabs on the bottom, right? Command window, documentation, variable editor and editor. You'll be using only the command window and editor for now. Uh, the editor is where you'll be writing in the code and the, com the command window, like this is the editor which I'm showing you right now. And the command window is where you will run the code. This is where the output of the code will show up. Okay, 
and uh, to create a new file or to create a new script on the top left you see a green uh, plus on a blank page right the new script so you click on that and a new script gets generated okay so let's begin with our first program so first we'll see how to display uh, some a message so you type in disk and brackets and uh, double quotes let's say i love math okay and we'll hit a semicolon see uh, we can uh, put a semicolon after disk and uh, input commands because because uh, the command is forced to run. It doesn't matter uh, like. I've told you that if you keep a semicolon after every line, it runs in the background, right? But in case of this one input, the octave forces the command to run and it will show up to the user. OK, so first we'll save this file. And le let me call my file basics. Save. And it will show up on the top left in the file browser and we'll run this right click and run. OK. So let's go to command window. And. Uh, oh, wait, I haven't loaded my folder properly. One second, give me a second. Let's uh, let's uh, name a new folder demo and then we'll load this folder on Octave. Okay. So let's close Octave. And to load the folder, you can go to C drive. Slash and then demo and then enter. And let's type in a program again. So this. I love man. We'll save it as basic. It should be saved in demo folder and you'll save it. And now let's run this. So as you can see in the command window, the output comes out. I love math that was expected. OK, and now let's do some basic arithmetic operations. Like suppose you just want to display what 2 plus 2 is. So you can just type in 2 plus 2. And like other programming languages, you can just type in like that and you can save it and run it. As you can see, it says I love math, which was our previous uh, code line and answer is equals to four. Now let's define variables and let's do some operations on that. OK, so let X is equal, let's be X be two and I'll put a semicolon at the end because I do not want the user to see that X is two. OK, and let Y is equals to three semicolon. I'll define a new variable called sum, which or let's give it Z. This Z will basically uh, be the output of X plus Y. So Z is equals to X plus Y semicolon and I want the user to see what Z is right. So I'll simply put Z. OK, and uh, I'll save this and I'll run it. So as you can see, it says I love math and Z is equals to five. Now observe that all the outputs of the previous codes are displayed as well, right? To clear this, you can use the command CLC, which I've told you earlier. Uh, you can you. It's a good habit to always uh, put this command CLC. There's one more command called clear all. On the left side, you see the workspace, right? Uh, which contains all the variables and the data types. It will clear uh, when, when you uh, like when you when the clear all command gets run, it clears all the stored variables of the previous run. OK, so it's always a good habit to write clear all and CLC on the top of your code. So clear all and CLC. OK, and if you want, we can run this program again. Yeah, as you can see, uh, it's uh, like the previous outputs have been cleared. And a new output has been generated. OK, so now let's see how we can take in. Uh, the user's inputs for our variables. OK, so X is equals to input. And then always note that between this the disk command and the next bracket like this bracket, there should be no space and the same goes for input. So the bracket after input, there should not, not be any space between input and bracket. Okay, so input enter your first number. We'll just add up the two numbers, the same the thing which I've done before. So enter your first number. OK. And then uh, we'll, we'll, hit, we'll hit a semicolon. Pi is equals to input. Enter your second number. OK. And then uh, Z is equals to X plus Y. And we'll print Z. So save it and run. So enter my first number, let's enter 10, then let's enter 23. 
the answer is 33 and it displays that okay so i hope you guys are clear with the basics uh, i'll take a two minute break and uh, you guys can experiment with these i'll take your doubts you can you guys can ask your doubts and i'll address them okay. so was it clear was everything clear till now could you guys properly code okay cool please show how to create a file yeah sure so you, on the top left, you see a green plus on a black page, right? It says new script. So you just have to click on that and you can write your code and then you hit control S. Control S is basically save. And then you can give your file name and run the, uh, like run the file. That's it. Please repeat CLC and clear all command. Please explain this semicolon again. Okay. I'll explain how CLC and clear all is. So see, uh, Suppose I remove clear all and CLC, okay? And I just simply run this. In my command window, the previous uh, runs output is displayed, right? On the top, you can see I love math, enter your first number 10, enter your second number 23, and then it goes to 33. This was the output of the previous uh, run, right? Now I, I don't want this to come again, again. I want a fresh, I, I want it to be a fresh uh, co uh, like output, right? So for that, you use CLC. CLC will clear the uh, previous runs uh, output and clear all. And if I type in clear all, it basically clears the values which are stored in the variables in the previous run. Like previously, I stored x is equal to 10, right? So now it will remove x. It will remove the value of 10 from x. It will take in my new uh, variable, like uh, my new value of the variable. So that's why you use clear all. And a semicolon. Okay, let me explain you what a semicolon is. So suppose. Uh, I give an x is equal to 2 without a semicolon, okay? And I give y is equal to 3, and I hit a semicolon, and then z is equal to x plus y, okay? And then I uh, print z, okay? So let's save this and run it. So what you know, what what is the meaning of this? Like, what, what are we expecting from the output? The output should be x is equal to 2 and the value of z, which should be 5. And y should not come. y is equal to 3 should not come because I've kept a semicolon at the end of the line. So that makes the command run in the background. So let's run this and see what the output is. As you can see, okay. Let's do an issue with the file one sec. Yeah, so now suppose let me remove the semicolon at the end of the line x equals to 2 and let's run the code. Okay, so let's run it. As you can see, it displays x equals to 2 as well as the output z is equals to 5. And it doesn't display y is equals to 3 because I put a semicolon at the end. So I hope that's clear. Uh, I'm not sure why are there a few lines between z and 7. Uh, something there's there prob there could probably be an issue with your formatting. That's weird. Okay, I'll just continue for now. You guys can ask it out later. So uh give me a second. Okay, so let's uh, go back to a presentation. So the basic stuff is done. Let's proceed. Let's go on to arrays. So what is an array? An array is basically used to store a collection of elements and each of the element is identified by an index. Like suppose you want to store, uh, like suppose you want to store the first and natural numbers, okay? Now you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to create many variables for that. You can create, I mean, you can create an array and each element of the arrow will contain the, uh, will contain a natural number from one to 10, okay? So there are three types of arrays, 1D array, 2D array, and a 3D array. A 1D array is basically an array, uh, like it's basically a row, and the row will contain your elements. And a, a 1D array is, is basically a one-dimensional array. And a 2D array is a two-dimensional array. It's basically a matrix, if you guys know what a matrix is. I mean, you guys would obviously be knowing. And uh, it, it will basically have rows and columns. And suppose you want a 3 into 5 matrix, so it will have, so my 2D array will have, a, will have 15 elements. Okay, so let's go to Octave and see how do we uh, define an array and initialize it. 
Yes, so let's uh, define a variable a, which is my array. And inside my box, like I'll create a, I'll uh, keep a box bracket and inside my box, I'll keep the elements of my array. Okay, so suppose I want my, uh, the elements to be one to 10. So that will be, that take a lot of time. So let, let's see for one to five, one, two, two, three, four, five. And then we'll print our array. Okay. Let's see what the output is. As you can see, it prints the elements of the array. So, uh, but now what if I wanted to print elements from one to 20? It will take a lot of time to manually like write it down, right? So there's a shortcut to it. It's basically the first element colon the last element. Okay, so one colon 20 because I want to print elements from one to 20. I mean, I want the elements from one to 20 to be stored in my array. So let's run. Let's see what the output is. Okay, yeah, so the output like one to 20 cannot fit in just one line, right? So like if I reduce the size, it would it can probably fit in one line, but because the space issue, it has shown the output in two lines. So like columns from one to 13 and columns from 14 to 20. Okay. Uh, yeah. So now what if I wanted to print elements? What if I wanted my elements to be from one to 20 and between two numbers there's a difference of three. By that, what I mean is I wanted my elements to be one, four, seven, 10, 13, and so on. Okay, so again, there's a shortcut to it. It's just an addition to this. It's going to be the first number, colon, the step difference, which is three, like the difference, which is three, and then colon, the last number. So one, colon, three, colon, 20. Okay, uh, we'll save it and run. As you can see, it displays the numbers 1, 4, 7, 10, 13, 16, 19, which is what we wanted. And it won't display 20 because 20 is not one mod three. Like it won't be generated in the sequence. Okay, so that's it for a 1D array. Let's move forward to a 2D array. Okay, so a 2D array for uh, for getting a 2D array, it's the same as getting a 1D array, except after you type in the elements of every row, you'll put a semicolon. A semicolon would mean go to the next row and consider the elements from there. Okay. So suppose uh, I wanted to create a two into three matrix and my first row has one comma two comma three, the elements and my second row has four, five, six. Okay. So one, two, three, a semicolon and then four, five, six. Okay. And then let's display my array. As you can see, uh, my array is sh shown. Now uh, I'll teach you a concept called indexing. So as you can see, like the first, uh, the first element is one. So the index of that is one comma one. What is an index? An index is basically an identifier to an element of the array. So and uh, the the index for two, like which is the second element, is one comma two. It's basically row comma column. Okay, the index is row comma column. So if I wanted to print what the value is in the uh, is in the two comma three element of the array. So for that, I can simply do a and then uh, brackets two comma three. Okay, and always remember that indexes start from one, not from zero. Uh, unlike other programming languages like Python and C, the index start from zero, but here the index start from one. Okay, so uh, two for uh, the two comma three elements should be six, right? So let's see what uh, Octave gives us. Yeah, it gives us six. So that is called indexing. I hope you guys understood this part. So let's proceed forward. So this is a 2D array. And this is indexing, which I've just taught. OK, now loops. So what's a loop? Like what's a loop used for? It's basically to execute a group of instructions multiple times a, uh, until a certain condition is met. Like if I want to uh, display my uh, this thing, uh, a number from 1 to 5, I want to display numbers from 1 to 5. Instead of writing them manually, I can create a loop and display them until a condition. My condition here will be uh, until i is less than equals to 5, it will display i. Okay. So there are two types. So, and it will be uh, by ever using loops is so that it can save our time. It can shorten the length of our code, right? So that's why we use loops. Okay. And there are two types of loops a for loop and a while loop. So there's no difference between these, as such, like uh, there's obviously a difference in syntax, but you can use both of them. And in some uh, programs, you will find it easier to use a for loop, and in some others, you will find it more better to use a while loop. Okay, so let's see how do we create for loop. So a for uh, 
a for loop. So uh, in this example, I've displayed numbers from k is equal to zero to five. So I have taken my variable k and I'm going to start with zero, and and I want it to and I want it to like increment after every loop and display what k is right. So I want my condition. My condition is that it will display k till k is less than equals to five. So let's see uh, how do we do that on uh, Octave. So my for loop will be uh, like the syntax will be for, and in brackets you will write your uh, variable k. This variable k will start from zero and will run till five. Okay, and I will display my k, and automatically for a uh, for loop will increment k after every loop. Okay, so I do not need to specifically write that down. And then I'll end my for. So let's see what my output is. As you can see, it prints out k is equals to zero uh, till k is equals to five. Now let's go to a while loop. Okay, so in a while loop, basically you need to specify what your initial uh, initial value of k is, and then you will write the condition after you write while. So while k is less than equals to five, it will print k. And unlike a for loop, you have to specifically write your incrementing k by one. Okay, so let me show you. I is equals to zero. Okay, that's my initial uh, value of i. And then while I write my condition, while k less than equals to five. Okay, I will display my i, right? And I will increment by i my i by one. So I can I, I can do this in two ways. I can either write i is equals to i plus one, or there is a shortcut to it. I can write i plus plus. So I plus plus, and I do not want this to be displayed. I want only the value of i to be displayed to the user. So I'll press a semicolon, okay, and then I'll end it. So save, and then okay, yeah, my variable is i. Okay, so I'll save it, and then run. As you can see, it's the same output as before. I is equals to zero uh, till five, and uh, yeah, this is another way of uh, getting this output. So. Uh, I will again take a one minute break in case you guys have any doubts you can ask. Somebody raised, uh, Archana raised her hand. Do you have a doubt? Show the code again, please. For for loop, okay. This is the code for both the loops. I hope that's clear. Can you show the previous file of printing an array? Yeah, sure. So it's just simple to print an array. You'll just type the array's name. Like you will first define what your array is and its elements, and you will just uh, type in the array name. That's all. You can do the same for a 2D array as well. Okay, then uh, if the increment operator is showing errors, then you can just use i is equals to i plus one. That's just a shortcut. With the end statement, no, the end statement wouldn't have an end. It should be from the start of the line. Yeah, it should work. Okay, what will it display to? Uh, some uh, two colon six colon nine. So it will display two and eight, right? Because two plus six is eight, and eight plus six is fourteen, which is more than nine. So it will display only two and eight. You can try that out. How to print only one? Yeah, uh, using indexing. Like I'll just show you in the presentation. So I've defined my array. S is equals to two, three uh, in the first row and four, six in the second row. And if I want to get three, the element three, I would use indexing. I would. It's the index is one comma two, right? So I'll just simply give a variable to that in to the to the element. Like second is equals to S, and in brackets I'll write the index. So one comma two, and that's it. I'll just in the output. Okay. I, I'll continue now. So loops is done. Now functions. So 
a function is basically a block of code. And suppose you have a set of uh, operations in your main program, the main program that you will run. And in that program, you have many operations that uh, that come again and again, that you have to write that operations again and again. Like suppose you are adding two numbers. So you have to again, uh, and you are adding those two numbers again and again in your program. So you can, instead of doing that, you can create a function which adds two numbers. And in your main program, you can call that function again and again. So you'll give some inputs, like you're adding two numbers, suppose the function is adding two numbers. So we'll give you so from the main program, the program which you will run, you will give in, you'll give in uh, the values of the inputs to the function. Okay, and then the function will do whatever it's ex ex expected to do and will return a value back to the main program. And when it and whatever it returns will be used to continue in the uh, rest of the program. Okay, so each function usually has its own .m file. In a sense, you create a new file for a function and it's preferred that way, it's recommended. Okay, so let's see how do we create a function on Octave. So we'll just, uh, like, we'll do this one, we'll do, like, we'll do this example only. We'll create a function to add two numbers. So we'll create a new file first. And this is how you define a function. Function, you write in function. And what you want to return? So that is denoted by ret, ret. Okay. So ret is equals to uh, my function name. So I'll call my function uh, as sum up. Okay, because it's sum it sums up two numbers. So sum up, and then my two numbers, a comma b. These are these the values of a comma b. Will be taken from my main program okay so function ret is equals to sum up a comma b and then i'll define what my ret is like i'll define what my function is so ret is equals to a plus d okay and then i'll end my function so end function and there should not be any space between end and function okay so let's check our function once all right i will save this and uh, we'll call it sum up And uh, in our main file, basic.m, we will create a program which will take in two numbers from the input, give it to the function, and get the output from the function. Okay. So let a be my first number. So a is equal to input. Enter your first number. Equals to input. Enter your second number. And then let's see store the sum of a and b. And then no, I mean we are using a function, right? So to call the function, you will write your function name, sum up. Sum up is my function name. And in the brackets, you'll give the variables, like what inputs you are giving to the function. You're giving a comma b right to the function. So we'll write an a comma b. Okay. So let's save this and we'll run basic.m. So enter my first number 12, enter 13. Oh, I haven't uh, defined. I haven't. Wait, let's uh, refresh uh, Octave because sometimes it throws an error when you create a new function. We'll restart Octave. And let's uh, open my folder first. And let's run basic. So 13. Yeah, as you can see, 13 plus 12 is 12 is 25. So in case after you create a function and it throws up an error, you restart your octave and then it's going to work. I don't know why this uh, this error comes up, but something in octave only. I don't know. So yeah, uh, I hope you guys have understood functions. Uh, let's proceed. So. I've written the same code here. You can refer to it uh, when we send you the presentation. Okay, now conditional statements. So if, else, if, and else. So uh, suppose a certain condition is met. You want a certain operation to happen, right? Like it can be to display a message to the user or something like that. So if a certain condition is met, you want something to happen. Or if some other condition is met, you want something else to happen. And if no condition is met, you'll either leave the program like that or you want like something else, like some other thing to happen, right? So for example, a simple example is a divisibility test of two. Basically, if a number is even, the program will check if it's uh, if it leaves a remainder of zero on division by two, and it will print that your number is even. And if the number is odd, like that, that you will use an else statement for that. So for all other cases, it will print your number is odd, right? 
So let's see uh, an example on Octave. Let's go to our main file and uh, okay, and uh, let's create a program for eligibility to vote. Okay, so the so it depends on the person's age, right? So let my user give his age. So age is equal to input. Enter your age. Okay, and uh, state my uh, if statement. So if age is greater than eighteen. It will uh, display. You can vote. OK. Now there's one more thing called else if and uh, it's basically if some other condition is met, it will display something else, right? So else if. Age is equals to is equals to 18. You write two is equals to is because this checking if it's true. OK, so that's why you use two is equals to is. So this. It's your first time voting. OK. And uh, else for all other cases and the all other cases here is basically if you're under the age of 18. So else. Yes. You should grow older. OK, and we'll end this. Uh, save this file. We'll just check our code once. Let's uh, run this. So enter my age. Suppose I'm 19 years old. It says you can vote. And uh, I'll run it again. And if I'm 18, it should give output. It's your first time voting. And if I am two years of age, it should say you should grow older. Yeah, fine. So Yes, whatever I've done is also written here. You guys can refer to it after the session. And with this, we are completed. We have completed the basics of Octave. And you, uh, the attendance forms have been circulated, I guess, or will be circulated uh, on Teams. So you guys can quickly fill in your attendance. And now I'll be uh, taking your doubts. Which quote should I show? Please go slow. OK, fine. I'll keep that in mind. I'll show functions again. So this is how this is how you can create a function. So for creating a function, this is the syntax function. Ret, ret is return. Return. What should return? It should return the whatever the function is returning, right? So ret is equals to the function name and the two inputs it's being given. So a comma b, and then what the function is doing? It's adding two numbers, right? So ret is equals to a plus b, and then we'll end my function. So I hope it's simple. Running a file is hard. I'm always getting only basics in my output. Are you saving your file? Uh, So completed soon. Yeah. I think the chat modes have answered most of your doubts. You guys can quickly fill up your attendance. I'll wait for a few minutes. No, the meat is not over. Uh, the main part is still left. Can you show the offensive code? Yeah, sure. Are the outputs.
where to see the output of the code, you see the output of your code in command window. Like on the bottom, you see four tabs, right? So one of the tab, one of the tabs is command window. So you click on that, and this is where the output of the code is. How to save the file as an octet file? It keeps getting saved as a document file. Where are you writing your code? Uh, are you writing it in the text editor of the octet? Yeah, it should be saved as an bottom extension. Let me show. Uh, yeah, don't. Uh, so are you saving the file with a dot and extension? Once check that, I'll show the function syntax. This is just a very basic function. Uh, I'm just covering the basics for now so that we can cover up as much stuff as possible. Not enough input arguments. Error in voting. That is just to it is B. No, you have to run your you are running your function as well. Don't run the function. Just like run your main file. So you have to right click on your uh, file name of the main program and then press run. Once uh, uh, Vasudev, once try refreshing Octave again, such errors come. If you have written your code properly and you're confident about it, uh, close Octave and run it again, and then run your file. OK, so let's continue. So we have completed the basics of Octave, and now we can start getting a code for the Euler's method, right? So let's have a recap question first. If you guys have paid just a little bit of attention also in the previous part, you guys should be able to answer this question. The chat mods will be putting up a poll for this. So the question is to solve the Euler's method, what should be given to us? Option A, initial conditions. Option B, the step size, H. Option C, the derivative function. Or option D, all of the above. I think you guys would have answered by now. Yeah, all of you have given the correct answer. Yeah, fine. Guys, good job.
So let's continue. Uh, the answer is obviously D, as you guys would have already answered. We need the initial conditions x1, y1, the step size h, and the derivative function d by dx. Okay, so getting started with writing a code for Euler's method, let's see for an example. Let our initial conditions be for the point 1, 1, that is x1 is 1, y1 is 1, and the derivative function is 2x, and our step size h is 0 0.01. Okay, so if you would have guessed the function f of x will basically be x square, right? You can easily understand that. So now we'll basically first write a code to find the next point x2 comma y2. So for that, we will first initialize what our initial conditions are, our step size and our derivative function. And then we will be writing uh, the equations for x2 and y2. x2 is basically as x1 plus h, right? The next point after x1 separated by distance of h and y2 will be y1 plus h times f1 the formula for uh, Euler's method. And then we'll print what x2 and y2 is. So as you can see, the output is like x2 is 1.01, .01, that is easily calculated. And y2 is 1.02, that's the output for y2. And as you can see, this is a very good approximation because actually y2 should be x2 square, right? 1.01 square, which is 1.0201. And this very is a very good approximation. Like 1.02 is a very good approximation. Okay, so now to write a like to write a code for the Euler's method to find the remaining points of x till the point we require. So we will have to repeat the the middle steps, right? The two steps: x2 is equals to x1 plus h, and y2 is equals to y1 plus h into f1 till a certain condition is met. So we'll be repeating these two commands using of uh, a loop. Okay, so I haven't coded for the last one because it's pretty obvious. I'll code for this. So this is the code for it. I'll code it on Octave. Okay. So let's initialize our uh, step size. So 0 0.01. And let's create an array for x, which will have like the, which uh, the array will have the elements, like the positions of x will be stored in the array, right? So we'll get an array for x, x is equals to an array for it. So x is equals to one colon, the step size h colon three. I, uh, the output of the program should basically be like the code should basically run till x equals to three. So basically I want my y for x equals to three, right? So that's that's the aim for, for this program. So x equals to one colon h colon three, that's my array. Okay, and uh, and our initial condition for y. So my, for, and I'll be creating an array, uh, array for y as well. So the first element of y array will be one. It's my initial condition. My initial condition is one comma one, right? So one. Okay. And now we'll be creating a for loop, right? So my for loop will run from let's uh, give an index k. So this k will iterate after every loop. So for k is equals to two. I'll explain why is it from two to length x later on. Okay. I'll explain why this is the case. And uh, see, I haven't uh, defined what my function is. My function is uh, my function for derivative is f of x is 2x, right? f dash x is 2x, right? So because that varies with every point, right? So I'll write it inside my for loop. So for f, uh, I'm like my derivative, I'm calling it f and I'm defining it using an array. So for f and for the k minus one element of f is basically two times x, the uh, k minus one element of x right so semicolon and then we'll write the Euler's method equation which is basically y of k is equals to y of k minus one the previous uh, element of the array plus uh, h times okay uh, f of k minus one now let me explain what i've done if it's if you guys are confused so i'm running my for loop from two to the length of x basically i'm running my for loop from two till the number of elements that x contains. Okay. And why am I doing that? Because we already know what the first element is, right? Of x and y. So I'll be running it from the second element till the length of x. And then I'm defining my function at every point of x. So f of k minus one is equal to two times x of k minus one because f dash x is two x, right? So, and that changes at every point. And then I'll be using this function to create an equation for uh, y, like which depends on x. So y of k, the k element of y will be y k minus one plus h times f k minus one. Okay. And now I'll be plotting this. This is how uh, you plot something, plot x comma y. 
Okay, and let's check our code. It should run fine. Yeah, as you can see, it generated a plot. Uh, I close that one sec. As you can see, this is this is what the plot comes out to be. Now it's not very clear that if it actually like represent y is goes to x square, right? So let me print the array elements of x for some random indexes, x and y for some random indexes. So let me just see for uh, the twenty first element of x, like what the value is, and the twenty first element of y. Okay, and uh, for like, and let's also do the same for the forty first element of x and y. So let's see what the output is. Yeah, so as you can see for uh, x21, it says 1.2 and y21, it says 1.38, which is a very good approximation to 1.2 square, 1.44. And if you want, and if you want an even better approximation, you can reduce your step size like to like 1 point, I mean 0 0.005 or something like that. Here we have used 0 0.01, right? So you could reduce your step size. And x41 is 1.4. And y41 is 1.956, which is a good approximation to 1.96. Yeah, and that's it. That's how you code for the Euler's method. You can refer to this. And this is a code template for the Euler's method. Here, you can just replace your values of h, your initial value of x, and your final value of x. So x is equal to dash colon h colon dash and the initial element of y. And uh, then you can create a for loop for this is obviously standard k is goes to two till length x and you can define what your derivative function is f k minus one is goes to what and then you can get your uh, array elements for y and then you can plot it okay so is there any doubt till now What does k mean? k is just an index. I'm using k to so that my for loop runs. Right? I need to define an index k so that my for loop will run. So y v to k is equal to two. Yeah, one sec. So v to k is equal to two because we already know the first elements of my x and y array, right? That's the initial condition. We already know uh, my initial uh, condition, so we already know what the first elements of x and y arrays are. So that's why I'm starting from two, and you can say that k is the index of the element of x and y. So that's why I'm starting my uh, for loop for k is equal to 2, and it will run on till the length of x, basically the number of elements in x. Why should we give k minus one instead of given k is this to one? Uh, why should we give k minus one instead of k is this to one? Uh, where? Yeah, so the code. Okay, I'll explain the code once again. So, see, first we need to define what our initial conditions are. 
I've been given with my step size h. So I'll write that h is equal to 0 0.01. And I'll be defining my array x, which will have all the positions of x. So my elements of the array x will be 1, 1 plus h, 1 plus 2h, and so on till 3. So I am creating an array for x. So this is how you create an array. X is equals to, I haven't written boxes, but that's fine. Like either you can create box or Octave will uh, understand if you do not write boxes that you're defining an array. So X is equals to one colon H colon three. And to store the values of X, basically, uh, like I want to store the values of Y corresponding to X, right? X has many elements in its array. So I want to store basically Y goes to X square. Basically, I'm doing an approximation for Y goes to X square. So I'll be storing the values of Y for each X in its array, in Y array. And the first element of y is one because that's my initial condition. One comma one is my initial condition. Okay, so we have been given with our initial condition. We have specified them. We have initialized them. Okay, and now we'll be creating a for loop to find the remaining values of y. We already know already know the values of x, right? One one plus h, one plus two h, and so on to three. Now we need to find the corresponding values of y. Okay, so we'll be run, we'll be running a for loop for that, and my for loop will run from two, the index two, till the number of elements that are contained in my array x. And for that, I'm using an index k. I'm defining a local variable so that if I can, uh, like, I'm defining so that I can get the remaining elements of my array y. And since at each x, my derivative is changing, I'll be defining my function, the derivative function inside the for loop. So it's basically f of k minus one is equal to two times x of k minus one, right? Because for getting the kth element of y, uh, x values at k minus one. So we'll be, and then after we write the derivative function, we'll be writing the equation for the Euler's method, which is y k is equals to y k minus one plus f k minus one into h. Okay, and then I'll be ending this loop, and I'll be plotting h comma y. And I guess now it's now you guys must have understood it. Did you guys understand this? Yeah. You guys need more time to uh, like write the code or something. Why we took x to three? Okay, you can take x to whatever you want. I just took it to three to plot the data. Like I, I want my final value of x to three. You can, yeah, it's random. So then I'll, I'll guess I'll continue. So yeah, this is the code template for the Euler's method. And now let's see uh, an application with which we can solve the Euler's method, which is the law of radioactive decay, dn by dt is equals to minus kn. You guys must have read this uh, somewhere in your 11th and 12th grade. So it's obviously the same code, except here I've just replaced the variables x and y with t and capital N, just for better understanding. And here I have taken the input for decay constant from the user. And using that, it will plot the data. So after I take the decay constant from my user, uh, suppose the user gives a decay constant, k is equals to two, it will plot the graph. And this graph is very close to the actual graph. Okay, you guys can refer to this example. I'm not coding for it because it's very similar. Okay. So now let's go to the next method. So whatever Euler's method was for, it was for ODEs, right? Ordinary differential equations. This final differences method, a new method, is for solving the partial differential equations, okay, PDEs. So you know what partial derivatives is, right? Like, do like suppose a function f varies with x and t. So do f by do x will indicate the partial derivative of f with respect to x. And uh, you basically have to differentiate normally, but you have to keep all other variables constant. So that's what a partial derivative is. So how do you like how do you go about this method? What is involved in this method? So you replace the derivatives with algebraic approximations. So you know what f dash x is, right? F dash x is nothing but as limit h tends to zero, f of x plus h minus f of x by h, right? So you'll be replacing that derivative with algebraic approximations. You'll be replacing that derivative to get an algebraic equation. And if you have 
many uh, what's called derivatives. You can replace all of them, and you'll get. Uh, and after solving the algebraic equations, you'll get an approximate solution. All right. So let's see that using a simple example. Let this is not a PDE. I know this is an ODE, but we'll start with ODEs and then go to PDEs. Okay. So let f dash x be f of x and uh, f of zero be one. And it's obvious that the solution is e to the power x, right? Now we'll use our finite differences method. So we know that we have to replace f dash x with f of x plus h minus f of x by h, and we'll assume that h is h tends to zero. We'll not uh, specify that. We're already assuming it. And uh, now we'll replace this f dash x with the the algebraic expression, and uh, we'll get a new expression after simplifying the terms. We'll get uh, f of x plus h is equals to one plus h times f of x. And our initial condition is already given to us. F of zero is one. And in this equation above, if we replace x with zero. You get f of h, which is one plus h, and then after you keep on replacing terms like that, you'll get f of two h is equal to one plus h whole square, and so on. And basically, if you haven't already understood, you'll get f of k h is equal to one plus h whole to the power k, right? So, but notice one thing: f of x is our actual solution, but all this f of zero, f of h, and f of two h just approximate the actual solution, right? So there's a conflict of notation. I cannot write uh, simply that f of k h is one plus h to the power k. I cannot write F of uh, x is equal to one plus h to the power k, right? Simply because it's just uh, an approximation. So for that, we'll define a sequence f k. Okay, this sequence f k is basically an approximation for f of x. Okay, where x is k h. I hope you guys can understand that. And what is my sequence? How to get the next term of the sequence? F k plus one is equal to one plus h times f k. Okay, and our initial condition. Is uh, f of zero is one, right? It basically means f zero is one. Okay, so I know I'm considering here my h is zero point five, which is obviously quite large. So we'll get a bad approximation, but just for simplicity, just for better calculation, I've taken a big value like h is equal to zero point five. You can always take zero point zero one to get a better approximation. So my first term of my sequence f zero will be will be one, and at what point is this? It will be at x equals to k h. Right, so here k is zero, so zero point five times zero, which is zero, and my next term of the sequence f one will be one plus h, so one plus zero point five, one point five, and this will be at x equals to one times h, so zero point five, and if and you can write the remaining terms of the sequence f two and f three, f two is one plus h whole square, f three is one plus h whole cube, and x equals to k h for k is equal to two and three, okay, and If we just compare these values to our actual uh, answers of e to the power x for x is equals to zero, zero point five, one, one point five, I mean you can write the answers and let's plot the data. Okay, let's see how well our approximation is. So as you can see, they are quite close. They're not that close because we have taken a bad value of h, but it's quite close. So we can use the method. I mean, uh, this method to solve PDEs as well. Let's take an example to do that. But before that, do you guys have any doubts? Let me continue. Okay, so we'll be seeing the heat equation. We'll use the method of differences to solve the heat equation. This is a PDE. So what is a what is the heat equation? The heat equation is U T is equal to K U X X. But what is U? What is T? What is K N X? So consider there to be a rod lying on the x-axis, and one end of the rod is at x equals to zero, and the other end is at x equals to L. Okay, and uh, assume that this rod is insulated, so there's no heat loss, and Like we have been given an initial conditions for the temperatures with vary with x. So at t is equal to zero, we have a function of t with respect to x at the initial time that t is equal to zero. Our aim is to find the temperature as a function of x at some other time t. So that is our aim. So you can do that using this heat equation. U t is equal to k u x x. U t is basically dou u by dou t, the partial derivative of u with respect to t, and k u x x is dou square u by dou x square. Okay. So we can we can use the approximation what we have learned before for the e to the power x thing. Do u by do t approximates to u x comma t plus delta t minus u x comma t by delta t, where delta t tends to zero. I'm not writing that because it's assumed. And uh, in case you guys don't understand what this equation is, is basically for a constant x we are derivating. I mean we're differentiating u with respect to t. So for u x comma t plus delta t minus u x comma t by delta t. Approximates do u by do t, right? 
So this is called a forward difference approximation because I'm taking a point after t, t plus delta t, right? So it's called the forward difference approximation. Similarly, you can write dou u by dou x, which is u x plus delta x comma t minus u x comma t by delta x. And here t is constant. Okay, so observe that in our equation, it's uh, ut is equal to kuxx. So uxx, right? So we're differentiating it twice. So basically, uxx is nothing but dou ux by dou x, right? So in this equation for dou u by dou x, we'll replace u with ux. So dou ux by dou x is uh, will approximate to ux x plus delta x comma t minus ux x comma t by delta x. Okay, and now uh, we again need to use our approximation for ux on the RHS. You can see ux, right? So we will use our approximation to replace ux. So what do you think will be good? Like uh, again, using a forward difference approximation for ux, or we'll use a backward difference approximation. By backward, I mean we'll replace plus delta x with minus delta x. So I'll not be solving, uh, I'll not be like showing you what doing a forward uh, difference approximation again does. We'll just assume that the backward difference approximation gives you a smaller answer. You guys can check it out. Okay, so a backward difference approximation is basically replacing delta x with minus delta x. And so just telling you what backward difference approximation is, dou u by dou x will approximate to u x comma t minus u x minus delta x comma t by delta t. And we'll replace this in the above equation, in the above approximation. And we need uh, this dou u by dou x at two separate points. At x equals to x, firstly, as you can see in the equation, and at x equals to x plus delta x. Okay. So, what will dou u by dou x be at x equals to x and x plus delta x using the backward difference approximation? It will be this ux x comma t at x equals to x will be ux comma t minus ux minus delta x comma t by delta x. And u x x plus delta x comma t will approximate to u x plus delta x comma t minus u x comma t by delta x. Okay, so hence if we plug this in to our u x x equation, we'll get uh, dou square u by dou x square. Okay, so these are just the steps dou u x by dou x. You put in the approximation, the forward difference approximation. Then for each of the terms, you put a backward difference approximation. And when you simplify it, you'll get this expression. It's not that simplified, but it's much smaller than the equation you must have you would have gotten if you used forward different approximation twice. Okay. Now observe that I first done a forward difference approximation and then a backward difference approximation. So intuitively you can tell it's a central difference approximation, right? Okay, so let's combine these two equations in our heat equation, and then we will get our uh, like our heat equation is ut equals to kuxx, right? So we'll replace these two equations and that to get this. And basically, what are we solving for? So just observe this equation carefully. You can see this equation has functions like u is is always a function of x and t, right? So it's uh, the u is getting evaluated in all terms at the time t, but in only one term is getting evaluated at t plus delta t, and that's what we require, right? We are solving the temperature at at a next time at the next time point after some time interval where we want to find the temperature with respect to x. So we're basically solving for u x comma t plus delta t, right? So u u x plus uh, u uh, x comma t plus delta t will approximate to u x comma t plus alpha times u x plus delta x comma t minus two u x comma t plus u x minus delta x comma t. Now what is alpha? Alpha is nothing but k delta t by delta x square. Now let's just intuitively think what is this telling us? Like, uh, how do we like? What does this represent? So it basically tells us if we have the temperatures at three consecutive positions at some time t. If we have the temperatures at three consecutive positions at some time t, like x, at x plus delta x at x and x minus delta x, if we have the temperatures at those those three points, you can find the temperature of the middle point, which is x. At some other at some other time means the next time, which is after that interval of delta t at t plus delta t, right? So that is the intuitive feel of that. So do you guys understand this? Yes, okay, cool. Then let's continue. Okay, now whatever we have, okay, fine. I've written whatever uh, I had told just like a minute ago that if we have the solution at three positions, x, x plus delta x, and x plus two delta x at time t, we can find the solution at the middle position at time t plus delta t. Okay. So this is the equation again. And I had 
assume that the rod lies between zero and capital L. But for the sake of having a proper proof, we will write uh, we will have x from A to B. Basically, the rod lies between A and B for time t is greater than equal to zero. Okay. And what do we see? We seek approximate values for u x comma t at some position x and some position uh, at and some time t. Right. So we will first divide the interval a comma b. We will first divide the x-axis where the rod is lying into n subintervals of width delta x equals to b minus a by n. And the endpoints of the subintervals will be obviously be given by x i is equals to a plus i delta x, right? So x zero will be a because i is zero, and x one will be a plus delta x, x two will be a plus two delta x, x three will be a plus three delta x, and so on. And x n will be a plus n delta x, and n delta x is nothing but b minus a. So x one, x n will be b. Okay. So hope you guys understood that as well. And similarly for delta t, we can write t j is equals to j delta t. But j is equal to zero, one, two, and so on. Okay, so i is basically the index of position, and j is basically the index for time. Okay, so let's replace these because uh, similar. Like remember in eighth bar x also we had done such a thing. So we'll do the same thing again here, and we'll get a new equation. Okay, we wanted an approximate solution to u x comma t or u i comma j, where i is the index for position and j is the uh, index for time. Okay, so if we replace all that, we will get this approximation. U i comma j plus one will uh, approximate to U i comma j plus alpha times U i plus one comma j minus two uh, U i comma j plus U i minus one comma j. And if you guys don't understand, like, what are we doing in this? We can understand this by a stencil. Okay. So in this stencil, i is the x-axis and j is the y-axis. And as I've told you before. If in a row we have we we know three consecutive the values of three consecutive uh, positions, then you can find the value of the middle position at the at uh, the uh, succeeding row in in the above row, right? So you can find u i comma j plus one, okay. And then if we have our initial conditions, if we have the bottom row most the u values of the bottom most row. One row, you can find j is to two row, and then you can generate all the other rows, right? So observe that you will get a triangle, and not all other or all the data points. You will get only a triangle because you are getting only the middle value, right? You are not getting the uh, other values. So what about like how do we find the data points for all other values, like on the sides and on the top? Because the triangle will end, right? So how do you do that? So for that, you need to you need to declare your boundary conditions. So what is my boundary condition? I assume that my boundary conditions is that the temperature is always zero at the endpoints for any time t. I'm assuming that my temperature is always zero at the endpoints. So, if you write that using indexes, you'll get u uh, u zero comma j is equal to zero for all j, and u capital N comma j is equal to zero for all j. Basically, yeah. So um, you get you get all the data points in your stencil. And yeah, that's it. That's basically it. Now you you need to just code for it. So first, there'll be a lot of values to initialize. Okay, and after you initialize all these values, you have to write your uh, equations for x and your initial value, and then you have to write your code for the partial uh, for the PDE. So let's open Octave and do that. But before that, are you guys clear with the method of? I mean, like, are guys clear with heat equation? Did you guys understand the heat equation and what we are doing? Okay. So, yeah, I'll be will be sharing the slides to you. You can go again. I know it's a little hard telling orally, so uh, you guys can see that. Okay, let's open Octave and code for it. So, okay. So first, we need to define the length of the rod. Capital L is equals to one. Let's have uh, capital L to be one. Okay, and let my uh, I'm running my code till t is equals to zero point one seconds. Okay, so let's declare my variable t, which is zero point one. Okay, and then. Uh, I will declare my heat constant as well. 
So let my heat constant be one, taking very simple values. So L, T, K, and what else? Yeah, we had divided our x-axis into sub-intervals, right? So let uh, N be 10, we're dividing into 10 sub-intervals, and let, be, let M be 50. We are having 50 time steps, okay? So if you guys don't understand, we'll be calculating the temperatures for 50 uh, values of time, right? For 50, after 50 intervals of time, we will be noting down our temperature, okay? And then we'll, uh, we know what our DX is. Our DX is basically capital L by M, uh, by N. Okay, and then our DT will be capital T by M. DX is basically the, I mean, the length of each sub-interval and dt is basically the length of the time interval. So yeah, L is equals to 1, T is equals to 0 0.1, K is equals to 1, N is equals to 10, M is 50, dx is L by N, and dt is T by M. So we have given our uh, initial conditions and everything. Now we'll create an array, like how we had created an array for position like x in Euler's method. We'll do the same thing here. We'll create an array for x. OK, so for i, let every index of my array be denoted by i. So i, this for loop will run from 1 till n plus 1. I'll explain why 1 to, to n plus 1. And then uh, each element of my array x will be xi is equals to i minus 1 times dx. I'll explain why this is true. And then I'll end. OK, I'll end my for loop. So what, what, is, what is this? Like What are we doing? So for the first element of x, the position is obviously zero, right? And for my second, like my second element of x, x2, x2 will be dx. And my third element, x3, will be 2dx. So my first element will be zero. Second element will, will be dx. Third will be 2dx. Fourth will be 3dx and so on. And we are running our portal n plus one because x n plus one will be n, n times dx, right? So we need to run, we need to define what the last element of our array is. So that is nothing but ndx. And ndx is basically L. So our rod is lying between 0 and L, and hence we're doing this. OK, and now, uh, now we have gotten a position area. Now we'll define our initial conditions. So for i is equals to, again, 1 is to n plus 1, the same logic as before. We will have our uh, initial condition array. I forgot to add a semicolon here. Semicolon is important. So let's call our, uh, let's have our initial condition the array name is u naught. Okay, so u naught i, every element of the array u naught will be like suppose our initial condition is sine pi x. Okay, so sine pi pi is already defined by octave. You, you do not have to define what pi is. So sine pi times x. Okay, and sine it will be sine pi x where x is the array elements, right? The array elements of x. So sine pi x of i, right? And then semicolon, and we'll end this for loop as well. Now we'll be coding our PDB. So uh, we want the values of temperature for 50 uh, intervals, for 50 intervals of time, right? After 50 intervals of time, we want what the values of temperature are with respect to position x. So for j is equals to 2, uh, I mean 1 till m. m is basically 50. So for j is equals to 1 till m, we're creating a for loop for that. This for loop will basically increase time, basically go to the next row. But what about increasing the position? We need to increase the position as well, right? For finding the values of temperature with respect to x. So for j is equals to 1 to m, we'll write uh, another for loop. For i is equals to 2 to n. OK, now why am I doing 2 to n here and not 1 to n plus 1 as before? I'll explain that. It'll be clear when I write the code. And now I'll be writing the equation, the PDE, the simple, the approximated form of PDE, which we had derived. So I've, I've got it written here. I don't remember what I got it written, so I'll write it. So yeah, so my next row, let's give an uh, array, let's give an array for that. It will be U1. Okay, I, the, in, uh, the uh, element I of U1, the equation for that, U1I is equals to u naught i I'm basically writing the equation what we had derived u1 i plus alpha times 
u not i plus one minus two u not i and uh, plus u not i minus one. Yeah. And then remember to close all the brackets or else it will throw up an error. So yeah. And now uh, we'll end both the uh, we'll end only one for loop. So we have gotten our uh, the function of temperature with respect to x at the next time, right? So we'll end the, this for loop. And then what we have see we have u naught we have gotten u one. Now, how to get u2, u3, and u4, and so on? You cannot keep on defining u2, u3, u4, and so on, right? There's a shortcut for that. So you have you have you have already been given u0, you have found u1. What you can do is you can make your u1 u0. So when your u1 becomes u0, this way j is equals to one row becomes u0. You can this for loop will run on for 50 times steps, right? So in the next for loop, it will find out what u2 is. So and then when you make this u2 your u0, your initial value, it will find then next uh, values, uh, the, the next row values. Okay, so I hope you guys can understand that. But first, we should uh, you remember about the boundary condition. We have to write that as well. So u1 at the boundaries will be zero. Right. And uh, what? Yeah, and let's make our u1 u0. Let's make our u1 row u0 so that the for loop continues. So u0 uh, is equal to u1. What, what is u0 equal to u1? Basically, whatever elements are in u1 will be now stored in u0. Okay, and that will be used in the next for loop to create the next row. Okay, and then that's it. We'll end this. So now let me explain about why have I taken the indexes. Like why have I taken j is equal to 1 to m and i is equal to 2 to n. So remember when uh, when I told you that if we haven't specified the boundary conditions, we'll be getting our rows like the data points in a triangle format. So for that, like look at that equation. U1 i is equal to U0 i plus alpha times whatever. So you you can get you won't be able to get U11 because that's the first element, right? You'll be able to get U12 because that will come out from like that that's, that can be considered middle point, right? So if we consider at the previous times, uh, we can consider temperature temperatures at the previous time step for three consecutive values. OK, so that's why we can get all the values for the next row from two to n, but not the boundaries. So hence I have created uh, my for loop to go only from two to n. OK, and yeah, that's it. I guess we can plot X. We can plot uh, U1 with respect to X. OK, and uh, should be written x comma u1. Whatever is in the x axis should come first, and then to make or actually let's just run this code and see if it runs properly or not. So run. Okay, there's an error in the syntax. Yeah. So guys, always be careful. Your code will not understand what two x is. It will understand what two times x is. So you have to put an asterisk, and then let's run it again. Oh, I haven't defined what my alpha is. So let's define what alpha is also. Alpha is basically k into dt by dx square, right? So, yeah. let's check out the plot, what it has generated. So, this is the plot. And if you guys can trust that this is the actual answer, what the plot will be for variation of t with respect to x at 0.1. If you can trust it, you can. But uh, if you want, uh, like if you want to prove that it is so, you can use a pen and paper and you can calculate all the values. But that will take a lot of time. So that's why you can just compute it numerically like this. OK, and uh, now observe this plot. It is not expressive. We do not know what X and Y is. We haven't given a title, right? So to show that, we can give X label and Y label. This is how you do show X label X and uh, Y label Y. Right, y label uh, y label u1 or y label temperature at time 0 0.1 seconds. And uh, let's give it let's give it a title as well. Title t versus x at 
t is equal to 0 0.1 seconds. Okay, so and now let's run it. Control save and run. So as you can see now, you you have got labels for the x-axis and y-axis, and you've got a heading as well. You can change the size of that, but we won't be discussing that now. So you guys have any doubts till here? Why do we use sign here? We're just giving any, we're just giving an initial condition. You could have had any initial condition, right? 2x, 3x, 4x, or some, some function. So I use this uh, trigonometric function sign pi x. So what is k here? K is the heat constant that is defined, that is physically defined by the properties of the rod. We won't discuss that. Index x is the number of array elements. Index must not exceed one. Okay, then check your code once. I'm not sure which index are you talking about. Which index are you talking about exactly? Can you show alpha once again? Alpha is k times dt by dx square. Alpha is k times dt by dx square. Uh, alpha is to k index index is the number of array elements. Did you define what your uh, Prutu, did you define what your position and uh, initial conditions are? Because your code looks fine to me. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, why it's throwing an error. And check your code again. Anyway, I'll be sending the code in the presentation. So, just check, just check how you have defined your position array and the initial conditions. Uh, so, yeah, that's it from my side. Uh, So yeah, thank you guys. Uh, there's one very interesting problem on the method differences in the problem set that you will get. It's a, it's slightly involved, slightly more involved. But uh, if you guys have understood the method of differences properly, and if you guys just refer to the slides once again, I'm sure you'll be able to answer it. It's a very interesting question. So thank you guys. If you have any doubts, you can ask, I'll answer them. Uh, you want to see the code? Uh, okay, I'll share it. Also, the code is code will be present uh, on this thing in the presentation, so you can check it. There are multiple pages of code.
yeah the feedback form has been shared please click on that and fill in your feedback and uh, So that is, uh, we have our uh, YouTube channels and our LinkedIn page. It will be very good if you guys could follow that and uh, we'll, be up, we'll be regularly updating that those two social media accounts with interesting problems for you to solve and uh, events such as this so, so that you guys can participate. And we have our website as well. The links of the website, social media, LinkedIn will be shared in WhatsApp. So you guys can keep track of those as well. Thank you. Thank you all very much for attending. Uh, we'll be continuing uh, in the next session on 21st June on Friday. Uh, we'll be sharing the problem sheet uh, in some time. Uh, please submit the problem set one by the end of today if you have seen the extension of the deadline to tonight. Uh, all the very best and hope to see you very. We'll be very eagerly waiting for you in the third session. Thank you.